Well, in this sermon, we will be looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. We'll read it and get into God's word. Which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth? just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace of God in truth. We pray that this would be used to honor your holy name, that this message, that we'd hear your word and respond with faith and obedience. In Jesus' good name, amen. How's your commitment, in particular, to the gospel of Jesus Christ? How's your commitment to the church of Jesus Christ? And how's your commitment to the mission of Jesus Christ? This article by Ricky Jenkins, entitled Rising Above the Preference Driven Church, will help us understand the culture in North America and its lack of commitment. He writes, We live in an age where preference rules. Today's culture values personal choice so highly it prevents many from committing to real priorities. Fifth marriages, live-in lovers, quick flings often characterize our restless society while commitment is at an all-time low. Sadly, many Christians allow the culture of personal preference to influence their idea of a perfect church. As a result, many treat their church like a beloved spouse. During the honeymoon stage, but when the romance wears off, they trade up for something new. Driven by preferences rather than priorities, should personal preference be the deciding factor in committing to a local church? Question mark. The problem with preference is, I look for what satisfies me. I look what satisfies me. When we think of Epaphras and his commitment to Jesus Christ, his commitment to the mission of Jesus Christ, and his commitment to the church of Jesus Christ, we never think Epaphras was concerned with his personal preferences. It is thought that Paul focused his attention to the larger cities and he sent others to the smaller centers like Colossae. So Epaphras was sent to his hometown of Colossae and probably instead of going to a larger city like Ephesus to preach the gospel. Taking your gospel to your small hometown in and of itself would have been an act of service and humility. But this is what Epaphras was all about according to the book of Colossians. Epaphras was a servant thinking about others and not himself. Lord, change our hearts and make us more like this. And Lord, root out the selfishness and pride in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Colossians is a very important book when it comes to the topic of the Lord Jesus. This book teaches the greatness of Jesus Christ. Paul and Timothy wrote this book to encourage this church to cherish Jesus above all things. We know that some in this church were teaching that you must do this or that to be a Christian. And Paul teaches clearly that Jesus is to be cherished above any food law or religious celebration. Paul teaches clearly that fullness of life is found in the person and work of Christ. Paul states in Colossians 1, 3-6 that he is thankful to God for God's work among them. In 1 verse 3. In 1 verse 4, Paul declares that he's heard of their true faith and their love for all the saints. And in 1 verse 5, this church had heard the preaching of the truth of the gospel. And the gospel that came to this church was the real gospel. And now we can continue on this section of Paul's thanks and prayer with three points in verses 6, 7, and 8. Verse 6. There's gospel growth, not only in the Colossians, but in all the world. We hear about a gospel servant, 1 verse 7, the man Epaphras. 
and we hear about gospel living in 1 verse 8. Their love in the Spirit. Let's look at gospel growth. We start out this sermon with verse 6 with a partial sentence. It says, which has come to you? The which that Paul is referring to here is the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you. We described the word of the truth of the gospel as Paul's teaching in the gospel in the book of Romans, but specifically Romans 3, 21 to 25. We cannot obtain salvation or righteousness by works of the law. We've all sinned and rebelled against God's glory, and that has put us at odds with God. We can only receive righteousness. It's a gift and be made right with God through Jesus Christ or through faith or trust in Christ. And the work of Christ that we can trust in is Jesus takes the sin of the world and bears the punishment for it and exchange gives righteousness to those who've received Christ through faith. This word of truth, the gospel, has come to the Colossians. How did this gospel come to the Colossians? We know by the next verse, verse 8, Epaphras preached the gospel to them. Paul, when he uses this word world, when he says the gospel has come to you in the whole world, he was not referring to every single person that was existing on the earth or every single nation. Because we know even now, the gospel has not reached even now certain people groups. But Paul was referring that the gospel had reached much of the Roman Empire. When we think of world in this context, it's referring to the Roman Empire or the Mediterranean area. This is long before the time of efficient water, air, or land travel. Paul could just not get upon Air Canada and fly from Rome and preach the gospel in Toronto or New York or anywhere else in the world. You almost need to equate this to certain people who live in our favorite city in Canada, Toronto. Many people see Toronto as the center of the universe and really that's the only place they, they ever have known because they've never left Toronto. Many people in the cities don't even have a car and couldn't even get to places like Dryden without train. They just can't hop into a car. They don't have one. So all they know is Toronto because they haven't left the area. That is the world to them. That's their world. And that's what Paul means. It's the world of the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean area. It's likely that Paul is writing this letter from Rome. And you can see how much this gospel is spread. It likely spread into Ethiopia because of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. But as well, it's gone northwest from Jerusalem to Rome. That's a lot of gospel preaching and a lot of hardworking servants in just a, new, in a short amount of time. The gospel is spread all over this area. Paul mentions that the Lord is doing two things with this gospel. First, it's bearing fruit in that it is increasing. Two important words about this gospel fruit. Now, <coughs> these two words are passive, which means God is bearing the fruit and God is increasing. This work was a complete work of God. God increases God bears the fruit. First, let's look at bearing fruit. This, word's to, this word refers to having a productive life in the Lord. This word means that the gospel seed has been planted and we see fruit from the work of the Holy Spirit. As well, this gospel was increasing. This word means that the gospel is producing. People are converted. People are brought to Christ. People are growing in the Lord. The language that is used here is actually very similar to the language that is used in the parable of the sower found in Mark chapter 4 verses 1 to 20. We read about the four types of soil there. 
The first type of soil in Mark 4:15 is there a seed that falls upon the soil and is immediately immediately taken away by birds or snatched by Satan. The second type of soil is the seed that falls upon the rocky ground and after they face trials their faith withers up and they fall away. Mark 4:16 the third type of soil, there is seed that falls among the thorns, and the seed is choked by the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. And these choke the plant from growing. The fourth type of ground is the good ground. Found in Mark 4.20, there is seed that falls on good ground. Mark 4.20 says, But those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word of God, they accept it, and they bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. This is the reality of God's grace and gospel work. You preach the Lord, you let the Lord do the work. Sometimes it just gets so discouraging. We sometimes see so little fruit, but we need to remind ourselves it's God who brings forth growth. We need to go to prayer to God to ask Him to bring forth gospel fruit and gospel growth. Do you remember what Paul said to the Corinthians about this topic? 1 Corinthians 3, 6-7. I planted, that's Paul, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Paul, Apollos, they're not anything. But only God who gives the growth. Do you hear that? God gives the growth. Paul continues on. Since the day you heard it, that's the word of truth, the gospel, and understood the grace of God in truth. The gospel growth and increase was evident in these Colossians. The Colossians heard the word of truth, the gospel. And we read that in 1 verse 5. Here Paul says that they hear the grace of God and they understood the grace of God. The grace of God in truth is connected to the word of truth, the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the grace of God in truth. If you're going to talk about the grace of God... And you're not going to talk about the person and work of Jesus Christ, then you're not talking about a biblical definition of grace. I remember years ago I heard a, song, a sermon on Psalm 32. It was a pretty good sermon, except they had an epic fail. They never pointed us to the grace and the blessedness of being forgiven of your sins in Jesus Christ. They they explained Psalm 32, but they never brought it to the New Testament where it's mentioned in Romans 4 that this psalm is fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. When we hear about the grace of God, when you think about the grace of God, do you think of the person and work of Jesus Christ? I hope that you do. Grace is defined as favor given to people through the work of Christ who do not deserve it. And this is what Jesus has done for us. Sinful people in this sinful world. Jesus dies in the place of sinful people. Showing them favor, mercy, wiping away their sin record, declaring them right before a holy God. Apart from the grace of God, our sins are many. But through Jesus Christ, his person and work, his mercy is more. The Colossians heard this, but they also understood this grace. And this understood word, or understand, is a very important word. It means more than just mentally grasping the grace of God. This is a deep understanding to the point that you actually own your sin and, you, and Jesus Christ is your greatest treasure. You recognize, look at the mess I've gotten myself into by my sin, but thanks be to God, only Jesus can deliver me from the mess and the punishment of my sin. 
To understand Jesus, you can speak about him and even know lots about him in the common word understanding. But this word is a different understanding. It's an experiential understanding. You've understood and you've experienced really and truthfully Jesus. Him as a person, his work. You understand Jesus because he's your personal savior. He's not just a historical person who did a bunch of good things in the past. They understood it experientially. Now we can go to our second point. We have gospel growth in 1 verse 6, but we also have a gospel servant. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. This verse gives us information about the missionary named Epaphras. Epaphras is really only mentioned three times in the whole Bible. He's mentioned in Colossians 1.7. He's mentioned in Colossians 4.12-13, where Paul writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature, fully assured, in the will of God, for I bear wit for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. And he's mentioned a third time in the book of Philemon. Paul writes, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. It is thought that Epaphras was converted through the ministry of Paul, likely in the city of Ephesus and then took the gospel back to his hometown, which is Colossae, like I've already mentioned. But Colossians 1.7 says several other things about Epaphras. Number one, he preached the gospel. Epaphras is not like many in our North American church context that have claimed a conversion experience and then never talked to anybody about what Jesus has done for them. Many Christians are silent about their faith in Christ. They almost got the cat has got your tongue disease when it comes to speaking about what the Lord Jesus has done for you. This was not Epaphras. He makes Jesus Christ known by preaching the word of truth, the gospel, and the grace of God. The ministry of Paul was very similar to the ministry of Epaphras. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, The word of truth, the gospel. Next, Epaphras was a disciple maker. Epaphras didn't leave these Christians under themselves. He didn't say, yay, you're converted. Enjoy your eternal life and abandon them. We know this from Colossians 4, 12-13. Epaphras labored in prayer for these Christians, Epaphras, labored in gospel preaching and discipleship so they could be mature in Christ. Although it's so exciting to see conversions, to see people used by God to bring someone else to the Lord, we must not forget the all-important work of encouragement, exhortation to believers so they can grow in the Lord. Three, he's described here as beloved. This is just the word love. Epaphras was first loved by the Lord. He was called and saved by Christ. But as well, Epaphras was loved by Paul in the Colossian church. Who cannot help but love a faithful preacher, pastor, and disciple maker that puts others before himself? Number four, he was a fellow servant. Literally, this word could be translated fellow slave. This means that the life of Epaphras, just like the life of Paul, was enslaved to Jesus and his work. But Epaphras was also a slave to the church of Jesus Christ. The life of, the life of Epaphras was given to Jesus Christ and his church. Number five, he was faithful. He was not a fly-by-nighter missionary or preacher. He served his hometown well by preaching the gospel. He also served his hometown well by enduring in prayer, disciple-making, by teaching and pastoral care. And finally, he's a faithful minister. This is the Greek word deacon. Deacon. 
A deacon is one who serves the congregation. And Paul gives this instruction to Timothy on this topic of being a minister or a servant of the church of Jesus Christ in 1 Timothy 4.6. If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good deacon or servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. This is what Epiphras was. So we've looked at the gospel truth, the gospel servant. Now we can look at gospel living by this last verse. He has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Epiphras communicated with Paul and he made known to Paul how this church was doing. What did Epaphras report? They had love in the Spirit. Now this word Spirit is the only direct reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is referenced in the prayer of Paul in Colossians 1, 9-11, this powerful working. But here we have the Holy Spirit mentioned. The Colossians had love in the Spirit, or the Colossians loved life in the Holy Spirit. Here we see that the Colossians were people who lived their lives in the realm, in the work of God, the Holy Spirit. This love in the Holy Spirit does refer to the love that they showed the rest of the believers. They were in the Holy Spirit and they showed love. Colossians 1.5, the love that they had for all the saints. They also produced in their lives the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And one of the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love. But this love in the Holy Spirit is conveyed other ways. Number one, we walk according to the Holy Spirit and reject the sinful nature. If you have love in the Holy Spirit, you're enabled or empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a holy life. This means that when we're tempted by our sinful nature, by the world, or even Satan, we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. We fill our mind with the gospel of grace and we walk away from sin and live a life of holiness. Galatians 5.16 But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Number two, we pray in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're depending upon God or you're empowered by God even to pray. You lean upon God's Spirit to even give you the words to say and to bring forth the truths of God to adore God for and the things to be thankful for. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit. And number three, we use our spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us for the benefit of the church and the glory of Christ. Since the Holy Spirit has given a believer spiritual gifts, they must gather together and use those gifts for the glory of the Lord and the building up of the church. Think of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 to 11. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who appointed to each one individually as he wills. This church had a love in the Spirit, and thus the work of the Holy Spirit was evident among them with love and other gifts of the Spirit. Well, how does this passage apply? Of gospel growth, the gospel servant Epaphras, and gospel living in the Spirit. Just two things to think about. Do you have gospel growth in your life? And in order to answer yes to that question, you have to have experienced the truth of the gospel and the grace of God in truth. In order to say yes, you have to answer the question, yes, I've been saved by Christ. 
If God has not saved you through Jesus Christ, you cannot have gospel growth. This is the amazing truth of the parable of the sower in Mark 4, 1-20. There's four types of soil. In the seed that falls on good soil, there's gospel growth, and the Word of God is sown, and it produces 30, 60, 100. An old-time farmer told me, there's no bad farmland, just bad farmers, and we see this here. Only the good farmer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit can cause growth. We cannot cause this seed of gospel to grow in our own lives by our own works. It grows through the grace of Christ, His work upon the cross. So the first part of this application is to examine, are we saved by Christ? Has Christ Jesus saved us? Are we truly born again? But the next part is to make sure that we're storing the gospel in our hearts and our lives. At the foundation of every person's relationship with Jesus Christ is his gospel. Are you storing the truths of the gospel in your heart? Are you preaching the gospel to yourself? Are you preaching the gospel to your spouse? Are you preaching the gospel to your children? In Numbers 15, Israel was commanded by God to store the word of God in their heart by putting the words of God on tassels. We see this in Numbers 15. They were to store the law of God and the grace of God in their heart. Here in Numbers 15, verses 39 to 41. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord, to do them, not to follow after your own heart, in your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after, so you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to the Lord your God. I am, listen how it ends, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. You hear how he ends with grace. God's grace. He's their God. Certainly, this does apply to us here. Are we storing this gospel in our hearts, the grace of God? Are we reminded of the grace of God and truth? Are we storing this in our hearts? Are we sharing it with family? Are we sharing it with those who do not know the Lord? And that it goes to our next application. Let us be an epiphras. In a world where everyone's preferences are reigning as supreme and as king in their lives. Let us be a people who are beloved, faithful servants of Jesus Christ and his people. Society is not going to tell us that. It says, focus on yourself. Even preachers are going to call you to focus on being the better you. Advertising, it doesn't call us to think about other people. It says, we need this. Because we deserve it. Even well-meaning people call us to focus upon ourselves. But Jesus does not. Epiphras was just like Timothy. Look how he's described in Philippians. For I have no one like him, that's Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. Let us, because of the wonderful grace of God given to us, be a people who are faithful ministers of Jesus Christ as we serve one another, not for us, but for the sake of Christ. Finally, since gospel growth is God's work, we need to ask God to bring about this gospel growth in our midst. We need to serve people by praying that God would save and deliver and transform people and be brought to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Will you serve like Epaphras in prayer? Praying for someone. Word. Speaking the truth of gospel. Indeed, serving people for the glory of Christ and His church. Will you? I pray that you will. Amen.